Good morning, everybody. Time to calm down all this rowdy behavior on a Sunday morning. Um, um, so my name is Sandy Wolfwood, a member of the Eco Justice Ministry team here at Westminster. Every year we present three forums that address various issues around environmental justice, and today concludes our three-part series. We've been presenting our social justice forums this year using a lens of investing in each other's future, hoping to better understand the structures and systems that have failed many of our neighbors. Adult Ed has incorporated a theme of disowning theology, examining how theological distortions can move us in the wrong direction. We can look at the theology of environmental justice using both of these themes, disowning a theology of dominion that views the planet as a subordinate resource for humans to distort, and taking up a theology of care of creation in which our role is to respect, to partner, and to tend. Um, I am going to turn this over to Steve Snyder to introduce our speaker, but before we do that, uh, for those attending here in the Meisel Room, raise your hand and I'll bring you a microphone so that everybody, including those on the live stream, can hear your question. And for those on the live stream, please submit your question or comment uh, through the live stream chat, and that will go up to our speaker. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Snyder. Welcome him. Um, the three of us share a commonality. We are, are um, have cabins on the same lake, so there's there's some in the right on the edge of the boundary waters. So, Steve. And the uh, cabins on the same lake, that's not entirely by coincidence. Uh, there's only uh, eight private cabins on that lake, and uh, and a good share of the cabin owner families uh, are represented here. Um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speaker today, Ingrid Lyons. Ingrid is the executive director for Northeastern Minnesotans for Wilderness. That is the lead organization <coughs> of the campaign <coughs> to save the Boundary Waters. She holds a graduate certificate in nonprofit governance and management from the Humphreys School at the University of Minnesota. She received her undergraduate degree in environmental studies from Carleton College. Anybody else from Carleton in the in the room? Uh oh, hostile audience right away. <laughs> We're Ingrid, right, right from the top. Ingrid first joined the campaign to save the Boundary Waters in 2015, serving as our regional organizer for the Arrowhead region. That's up the northeastern Minnesota area. After a break to complete her graduate studies, she returned to the campaign as our development director, helping to build the organization into a $3 million a year organization to save the Boundary Waters from this copper mining threat. Last year, last fall, Ingrid was elevated to become the executive director of the organization. I first met Ingrid years ago, as, as Sandy met, when her parents uh, uh, bought a lot and first began uh, uh, camping in a tent and then building a small, uh, basically one-room uh, remote cabin uh, on that lot the first summer. I think it was the first summer uh, uh, a bear visited their uh, campsite there on the lot uh, uh, on it. Uh, Ingrid grew up in New York City. <laughs> And uh, she, uh, she attributes uh, to that family cabin on the edge of the Boundary Waters Canary Wilderness. She attributes that to her love for the wild and in particular for the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. When uh, Ingrid graduated, was graduating from Carleton College, uh, she was looking for a potential career in the nonprofit world. Uh, I paddled over on a rainy day from our cabin and we sat and we visited about the, the threat of copper mining and the, uh, and the need to oppose that. Uh, and now she's our executive director. <laughs> These last few months uh, since Ingrid uh, took over the campaign have been very, very busy for the campaign. And we've had a lot of successes, but I'm gonna let Ingrid tell you about those. Ingrid Lyons. Thanks, everybody. It's really, it's very nice to be here. Very nice to see you in person. Um, and hello also to the streaming audience. 
Uh, so thanks, Steve, for the intro. Uh, my name is Ingrid Lyons, Executive Director of Northeastern Minnesotans for Wilderness, which is the lead organization for the Campaign to Save the Boundary Waters. So the Campaign to Save the Boundary Waters is a project of Northeastern Minnesotans for Wilderness. Um, what I'm going to do uh, today, what my plan is, uh, is give a little bit of background on the campaign. I know a lot of people are pretty familiar with the threat of sulfide or copper mining in the Boundary Waters watershed, but I'll give a little bit of context, give an update on where we are, because like Steve said, lots and lots has happened, um, especially since last fall. Uh, and then I'm going to transition a little bit into talking about critical minerals and conversations around what it takes to transition to a green economy. Uh, we hear a lot of arguments, especially from the sort of pro-extractive side, about how these minerals and this type of mining is critical if we want to combat the climate crisis uh, through a transition to a green economy. So how do we reconcile not wanting to see mining like this in places like the watershed of the Boundary Waters and other places with the fact that we want to combat the climate crisis and that we want to see uh, green technologies and green energy be developed sustainably. Um, so the Campaign to Save the Boundary Waters works to protect the Boundary Waters, but also the Quetico Superior ecosystem. Um, the Boundary Waters, fun fact, is America's most visited wilderness area. Um, it is also one of the largest wilderness areas. Um, I think it's it's east of the Rockies and north of the Everglades, I think is that geographic chunk. Um, and it contains 1.1 million acres of very connected waterways, very dense woodlands, and that's just the boundary waters. When you combine the whole ecosystem that's comprised of the Superior National Forest, uh, the Quetico Provincial Park in Canada, and Voyagers National Park, our state's only national park, uh, you get over 4.4 million acres of this continuous, rare, freshwater ecosystem. So it's truly a national treasure up there. Um, our goal, uh, since the very beginning of the inception of the campaign project of Northeastern Minnesotans for Wilderness, which started in about 2012, has been to permanently ban sulfide ore copper mining in the watershed of the Boundary Waters. Um, so sulfide ore copper mining, uh, according to the EPA, is our country's most toxic industry. And what has been proposed next to the Boundary Waters, about a quarter of a mile actually, just outside the Boundary Waters on the South Kawishwi River, if you're familiar, is a very, very large copper mining development um, owned by a company called Twin Metals. Uh, Twin Metals is actually owned by a Chilean company called Antofagasta, um, and they seek to mine copper, nickel, and other trace metals from four deposits immediately along the waterways that flow directly into the Boundary Waters. So the thing about that watershed is that the water flows north once you get north of the Laurentian Divide. So all of these projects, um, and this type of mining has never been done without some form of pollution, might I add, are immediately upstream of the wilderness. Um, in fact, one of the deposits is actually proposed for under the lake not totally sure how they're they're thinking about that, but I think that that sounds like a pretty bad idea to me. Um, so what the campaign has done uh, over the years is we have a multifaceted strategy. We thought to ourselves, okay, how how can we make sure that these protections are as solid as they can possibly be? And so we looked at what can be done on the state level, what can be done on the federal level, what can be done via litigation and what can be done through administrative action. We want to stack protection. So we're not just going for a congressional bill and calling it good. We want a congressional bill that protects federal lands in the watershed, and we want to see Minnesota's rules change to be more protective of the boundary waters, and we want to sue to create legal precedent, and, and so on and so forth. So we really have a very robust strategy, and what's been happening lately is a lot of action on the federal level. So our path to permanent protection on the federal level is threefold. So like I said, we've been focusing on one company, um, Twin Metals Minnesota, because they are the furthest along of all the companies that are kind of looking at this area for development. Um, and so what we needed to do is work with the administrations. And at this point, we worked through three administrations, Obama, Trump, and now Biden. Um, to cancel the federal mineral leases in the watershed 
So it's on federal land. Our country's, our nation's land is where they want to mine these minerals. And so the federal government can say, actually, you can't, we're not going to lease this land to you for this type of development. Um, so that happened in January of 2022, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of the things that you can do procedurally uh, that the Department of Interior can do, the Secretary of the Department of the Interior, is look at the mineral portfolio of the whole country. So there's public lands across the country that specifically can be leased by the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Interior, USDA, to companies for things like logging, mining, all sorts of different things. This portfolio includes a lot of land within the watershed of the Boundary Waters. And fundamentally, we've been arguing that that land should not be there. That land, that federal land in the watershed should not be leasable for this type of mining. And lo and behold, uh, we've probably asked you for public comments a lot. We've submitted a lot of science. We've worked with elected officials. They, the administration, the Obama administration started a study to say, hmm, maybe we should take these federal lands out of this watershed. Um, that study started was stopped and then totally uh, sort of put in a black box by the Trump administration, and then the Biden administration got it back to the light of day. And so uh, they completed that study at the very beginning of this year, and I'm happy to say that the Secretary of Interior, Secretary Holland, she decided to put a 20-year mining ban in place on federal lands in the Boundary Waters watershed on this type of mining, which is very exciting, yeah. So this is the most allowable by one of our environmental regulations. It's called FLIPMA, the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. Um, and basically what this does is it's an acknowledgement that enough studies and enough information has been gathered to say this land should not be part of this program. And it can happen in a myriad of different sort of industries and things. But for this, in this case, a very robust study that found this industry would be devastating for this ecosystem. And so... She can't protect it forever. She can't protect the watershed forever, but she can protect it for up to 20 years. This has also happened in the Grand Canyon um, against uranium mining. So they protect it for 20 years, and in that 20 years, we got to take uh, the most advantage as we possibly can to pass a law through Congress, and that makes it permanent. And so that's the third part. So, you know, we did the check, check. <laughs> And now we're on to the next phase, which is uh, getting this law passed. And uh, Representative Betty McCollum of St. Paul is our champion. She's introduced the bill three times. Um, she's introduced it again in this Congress, even though it's widely accepted that this Congress will be extremely ineffective in terms of getting uh, a lot of things passed. Um, but it's still important to show up. It's still important to talk to lawmakers about this. So we're actually going to D.C. next week, the week after. Um, partially because we've also had some challenges that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. Um, so the specifics of the ban is that Secretary Holland signed what's called a public land order, and it withdrew over 225,000 acres from this federal leasing program that I was telling you about from the Superior National Forest for 20 years. So it's a, it's a huge, huge deal for this fight, and it's the most significant conservation measure for the Boundary Waters in 45 years. Um, the fact that we can say that the Boundary Waters is technically protected till 2043 is, like, kind of mind-blowing. So we owe Secretary Holland, the Forest Service, and others a huge, um, huge, huge, huge thank you. Um, just a little bit about the geography. Um, I was going to step away, but I don't think I can. That's okay. Oh, I can? Okay, great. Here I go. I'm going mobile. Going mobile. Um, so uh, these are the different deposits uh, that Twin Metals seeks to mine um, that I was talking about. And this dark line is the Laurentian Divide. Uh, and so everything north of this, the water flows north. Down here, the water flows south. Um, obviously, what makes that particularly dangerous is that the water here will come out of the wilderness flow past these, all these different deposits down the South Kawishwi, then the water turns and takes it all back up into the heart of the Boundary Waters, into Canada, over to Voyagers and onward. Um, and the water is extremely interconnected, so this is the type of pollution that would be extremely hard to mitigate. Um, again, this in type of industry has never been done without some form of pollution. 
Uh, it's mostly done in very arid environments in the desert southwest, and even there, it manages to pollute water. So let's talk about water-rich environments and how poorly compatible that is. So just a little bit of geography. Um, if you're familiar with Ely, Minnesota, Ely's right here. Grand Marais is over yonder. Um, Duluth, you can see a little bit on where we're, where we're talking about right here. Um, I saw that you might have a question. Um, we'll largely wait till the end, but I will make an exception. Oh, no, that's okay. Dynamic conversation. Uh, you mentioned Canada. What, what is their position on this? You know, we get that question a lot, and we actually have a whole blog called, What About Canada? Because everyone's like, what about Canada? <laughs> um, Canada is concerned. Uh, the Canadian government uh, is very concerned about this project. Uh, we have a treaty uh, between us and Canada that, you know, talks about transboundary pollution um, and that we shouldn't be doing that to one another. Um, and so a number of letters have been written uh, along the process of getting to this withdrawal. The Canadian government has uh, spoken out on this. There's an international joint commission of citizens from both Canada and from Minnesota that meets on this issue, make sure they stay apprised of everything that's going on, but it is very concerning, um, especially when we talk about the Quetico, which is that provincial park that is immediately north of the Boundary Waters and would be immediately threatened. Let's, uh, yeah. uh, I think we need to hold all of our questions because we don't want to deserve it. In Western Canada, they've already polluted. They've killed all the trees in like 250 acres. Mm -hmm. So it's already been accepted in Canada as a process. I have an extractive metallurgy degree from South Dakota School of Mines. So I've studied the process. I know how acid intense this process is. It creates acid rain, it kills trees, and it pollutes water. End of story. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. I have a. I. I I'll. I'll keep it tight on the questions till the end. We'll save them till the end. Um, but I will leave time for questions. Um, so that's a little bit of just sort of the context. And what I wanted to talk a little bit about today is one. One argument that's really been coming up quite a bit on the national sort of stage, and it's also been coming up within the state of Minnesota, which makes sense because we as a state are grappling with our relationship with copper nickel mining. Copper nickel mining has never been done in the state of Minnesota. We obviously have a rich, rich history of iron ore and taconite mining, but uh, copper nickel mining is a whole different beast. And so, um, you know, it's become a national talking point. And so what I wanted to sort of address is the idea that um, companies often, and you'll probably hear this in the news as well, oversimplify this concept that you know, we need to mine in places like Northeast Minnesota so that we have the minerals that are essential to a transition to a green economy. How do you fight that argument? You know, how do you, how do you sort of hold those two truths at the same time? So like I said in the beginning, but I am gonna again, again take a step back because what on earth is a critical mineral? Um, so a critical mineral is any mineral element, substance, or material designated as critical by the Secretary of the Interior, acting through um, the Director of the U.S. Geological Survey. This is the list of the 2022 critical minerals. These are the two that would result, uh, be mined uh, with a twin metals mine. Um, I will get to why copper is not on this list, but do note that copper is not on this list. So a lot of these are rare earth minerals. These are um, kind of more generally speaking, they act on this list from a standpoint of national security. What's necessary from like a domestic supply standpoint, what's necessary from a technology standpoint, what competitors have, that kind of thing. Um, and so as that summary, we need a domestic supply of critical minerals. We need minerals in the United States for national defense and a green economy, and the only solution is more mining at home. That's the broad argument. Um, what we, the catchphrase really is a green energy transition. Um, this new direction that's been charted in Washington, D.C., you know, really wants to, 
to solve the problem of cl climate change and the climate crisis. And it should be generally cause for celebration, but we have to start kind of looking through a lens of caution. Uh, many industries, including many mining companies, including Twin Metals, now seek to make themselves look essential to the nation's success and survival from a climate crisis standpoint. Um, a lot of companies are trying to attach themselves to clean materials and clean energy, um, and they pose this as the reason why this project should be done. It's not about the boundary waters, it's not about that. We need to be thinking more broadly. We need to be thinking about climate solutions. Um, and so we call this tactic greenwashing. Uh, you've seen it many times, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of different versions of greenwashing. There's also sort of like the social greenwashing. Joe Camel is a really cool dude who smokes cigarettes. Uh, you know, it's sort of that company presenting one version of themselves in order to sort of distract the consumer from some of the realities. So greenwashing is the act or practice of making a product, policy, activity, et cetera, appear to be more environmentally friendly or less environmentally damaging than it really is. Someone has actually said this to me. Twin Metals Mine is the solution to the climate, climate crisis. If you don't support it, you are contributing to the climate crisis. You must not care about climate change. I, it took me a long time to respond to that person because I had to scoop my jaw off the floor and uh, get my, my head back on. So um, I'm speaking pretty broadly, but of course my experience is really through this Twin Metals and Antofagasta mine. So I'm gonna kind of keep going back and forth between more general and more specific to what Twin Metals has done. So an example of this from the company Twin Metals is um, a few years ago, they put out all this information about how their fleet of vehicles that they were gonna use in the mine were all going to be electric. Um, very exciting. Um, they could read, uh, by doing this, they could reduce on-site greenhouse gas emissions by about 65%. Notwithstanding this supposed decrease, the proposed Twin Metals mine is expected to produce more than 27,500 tons of emissions through mining activities such as blasting, crushing, and heating alone. Um, and there's a lot of electricity that takes, uh, that's taken to make these projects work. More than 781,400 metric tons of carbon dioxide would be emitted annually from electricity used to operate the Twin Metals mine. So again, frame it as we got electric cars, but you ignore this bigger fact that it in and of itself is a very emitting project. Um, kind of more generally, what you can sort of see through multiple companies, um, so again, kind of taking a step back to being a little bit more broad, the companies like to talk about three main things. And this is really picked up by news, this is picked up by elected officials. If any of you are familiar with Representative Pete Stauber, he loves to talk about this kind of stuff. He's the representative from Congressional District 8. Um, and what they say is, okay, so, it's about the amount of minerals produced and the contribution to America's total reserves. It's about securing a domestic supply of minerals and avoiding having to trade with non-allies. And on top of it all, it can be done safely. Yay, how convenient for everybody. Um, so what it's really important to know when you're looking at these claims um, of individual companies or more broadly, uh, are the realities of our mineral consumption, how the project sort of shapes up to the mineral consumption. Uh, you really have to be, you have to scrutinize the information and be thoughtful when you're ingesting information because there's a reliance on our willingness to just accept what we hear and see. So we have to really ask questions. Um, so here is what we have in reserves uh, compared to US consumption of a few just sort of key critical minerals. So nickel, uh, we have 0.1%, but we represent 8.3% of global consumption. Uh, cobalt, 0.7, U.S. consumption, 8.7. So our reserves are quite a bit lower than our consumption rates. Um, that just is what it is. This is the reality of a twin metals mine. When they say we are the answer to the climate crisis, the reality is they would be able to provide 2.3% of current annual U.S. copper consumption, 1.5% of current annual U.S. cobalt consumption, so that's 1.5% of 8.7%, and 3.6% of current annual U.S. nickel consumption. So again, 3.6% of 
of 8.3%. So we're really talking very, very little. And this is over the entire lifetime of the mine. Uh, this deposit, the whole Duluth complex, which is that stretch of minerals that goes basically through northeast Minnesota, it's a really low-grade ore body. So when you take out 100 pounds, picture 100 pounds of anything, over 99% of what they take out of the ground is waste. It's less than 1% mineral, mineralization, and that's throughout the whole body. So a lot of processing. I will have you ask a question first on the... Yeah. Oh, the question is, can you define reserves? So reserves, as I understand it, is uh, readily mineable uh, minerals as well as what we already just have that's been mined or is anticipated to be mined in existing projects. Um, so, you know, it's really a speck of dust and the, the waste rock thing is that, you know, part of why this industry is so harmful, when I say sulfide ore copper mining, sulfide ore means that there's the rock body that the minerals are in are sulfide bearing. And what that means is when it's brought to the surface uh, and exposed to things like air and water, it releases acid, lots and lots of acid. Uh, it's called acid mine drainage, and it leaks, leaches out heavy, heavy metals and minerals like mercury, lead, arsenic, and all of that runs off into the lakes and streams of the boundary waters, and it is then untraceable. It goes into the bodies of fish, it affects wild rice, it affects the 1854 ceded territory of the Chippewa Ojibwe, which is that they retain rights to hunt, fish, and gather on that land. But if you can't eat the fish, you can't eat the wild rice, how can you take advantage of your treaty rights? Um, so it's also important to know where we currently get these minerals. So you might be saying, okay, that, those numbers were, it seemed like we didn't really have very much in comparison to how much we use, so how, how are we getting these minerals? We're one of the top five copper producers in the world as a country. Um, copper is readily recyclable, and we've got lots of that, lots of existing copper mines in the desert southwest, um, among other places. We also get our minerals from allied countries. We have a long, long trading history with allied nations such as Canada, Australia, Norway, Finland, among others. But there is another form of kind of greenwashing that you should be aware of um, that I think also presents sort of a equity and justice issue, which is called fear-mongering. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this. I actually got an email, a promotional email just yesterday that basically said, if we don't mine next to the boundary waters, we have to mine in China. And China's evil for these, these, and these reasons. You know, talk about TikTok, talking about national fence, spy, spy balloons. Spy balloons was a phrase in that email as well. Um, so, it, and that's, that's the, those are the solutions presented. We either mine here or we feed into this evil competitor of a super global power. Um, the funny thing is when you do a titch of digging, the Twin Meadows mine would produce copper and nickel concentrates, which are an immediate product that must be smelted and refined before it becomes pure copper and nickel. The US has no nickel smelters, and the copper smelters that we do have are vertically integrated with companies already, meaning they're at full capacity. So if a Twin Metals mine were to send them copper, they'd say, sorry, no, we, we, we can't take your copper. We are too busy. Um, so what are they going to do? Funny enough, the company that owns Twin Metals, Antofagasta, has a long track record of sending these concentrates to China for processing, where then they're turned around and sold on the world market. So I don't think that's like a domestic supply solution uh, when you're actually sending it to the folks that you're trying to sort of make us all really afraid of. Because, um, yeah, you turn around and sell it on the global market. So when Northeast Minnesota companies or when Twin Metals says, you know, they are really, they care about the community, they're deep in it, um, where's the wealth that sticks around? You know, where's, where's the product going? Where's the domestic supply that they're, they're, they're touting. Um, I'll get to you at, at the end. Um, 
And so it's, again, you just really got to, you have to pay attention. It's really important to know about the company and also what their track record is. Um, so finally, the point that a lot of f companies say just really sort of sweepingly is, uh, can this type of mining be done safely? They say, yes, you know, we can do it. Uh, there's all this technology that means that we're going to get it right. This time, we're going to get it right. Um, no, uh, none of the sulfide ore copper mines that have ever, like I said, uh, been in operation have been done safely. And so one of our core arguments is the technology is not there. And we in northeastern Minnesota and Minnesota overall I, I, in the Midwest and the whole country should not sign up to be guinea pigs in this water-rich environment. Because if you weigh, and I think this audience you know, definitely uh, you know, is aware of this and feels this, if you weigh the loss against what we would gain. So imagine we did have a 20-year copper mine up there. We get a bunch of copper. It's this drop in the bucket for the green economy. And the Boundary Waters is irreparably destroyed for generations upon generations. The reclamation timeline for this type of mining is 500 years. I don't know, what was that, 1523? What was going on in 15, no, 1573? What was going on in 1573? I mean, that's a long time. It's, it's, it's not realistic. Um, and so you might be thinking, I would love some solutions. Um, this is where I think that the, the eco-justice conversation really gets um, more pointed because what we, what we deal with from sort of the folks who are really big mining proponents and have these sort of clean, misguided or maybe misleading rebukes on our, on our work in general and also the idea of protecting the boundary waters is things like, well, if we don't mine here, then you support um, slave labor in the Congo. Um, if we don't mine here, we have to mine in China. Uh, and then even from, you know, even from folks who are kind of more middle of the road, folks who, you know, just have that question, when you shut down a mine, if we, if we are successful in getting the Twin Metals mine out of the watershed, where will they mine instead? Will they mine next to my community? Will they mine next to my family's community? Will they mine in a reservation? Um, you know, what... What's the trade-off here? Um, and so before we get to that part, you know, there are some solutions. I think recycling very generally is something that is also oversimplified. But there's a lot of really good information on how the United States could really reduce demand for minerals by investing in a more circular economy. So it includes recycling, but it also re uh, includes reuse, manufacturing improvements, and substitutions, and a lot of these things would actually create the very same jobs that a lot of mining companies say that they're, you know, going to create. So we could actually, I like to say, feed two birds with one scone. Um, could feed two birds with one scone here, and both get into the recycling and reuse space, and generate the very same jobs that um, a lot of regions are really hurting for. Um, and the other thing is consumption reduction. You know, the green economy is, sometimes it's big and hard to think about, and uh, it's kind of, I think, sometimes posed as a blanket solution. Well, you can be a climate warrior if you get a Tesla, you know. Um, and it's actually not everything we consume has to just be replaced with something better. We can also think about the ways we consume things the ways we engage with this type of technology, the ways that we interact with the old, our old laptops in our house. You know, there's, there's many other things that we can do. It's not always just about replacing what we already consume. Um, and so kind of back to the, the concept just before, and I'll end on this before I start taking questions. The timing really worked out. I'm gonna pat myself on the back. Um, is that the reality of the costs of a green transition are highly uneven. Um, wherein significant amounts of raw materials for renewable energy and clean technology, which is what is needed, will need to be outsourced, and often that comes from a few developing countries. Um, and so I found this really great, this is, this is a part of the work that we don't, we're not as 
immersed in. But I found a really great source in preparing for today um, called Mining Our Way Out of the Climate Change Conundrum, The Power of a Social Justice Perspective. And it says, a social justice perspective on the green transition enables our global leaders to transcend the hard security and geopolitical perspectives dominant in policy debates. The perspective allows new policy ideas about equity and ecological compensation to be incorporated into the economic growth question. It gives voices to mining communities and advocates of environmental justice about the importance of transparency and decentralization in mining governance. Um, and so it's really just a lot more nuance and that transparency piece is, is important. You know, I shouldn't have to be here, you know, after hours and hours of digging, digging deep into the companies, this, that, and the other thing for you to have the information that empowers you to say, actually, this company is not the solution to the climate crisis. I don't need to choose between mining next to the boundary waters and transitioning to a green economy. Um, so that transparency piece is huge. And what really I think we can all be doing is informing ourselves, you know, really tuning in to the projects and the, and the sort of special places that we care about, but also advocating for policy reform in con developing countries. You know, there really is a, and the Biden administration has started to do this a bit with, um, I think the Congo, there was an article just a few weeks ago, um, where it's the acknowledgement, yes, we'll need these minerals. How can we get them safely? How can we get them uh, ethically? How can we get them in a way that's environmentally sound and actually does help us as we face this terrifying thing that is the climate crisis? Um, and so this is a little bit of, you know, the conclusion, this oversimplification again, the United States must open new minds in order to combat the climate crisis and avoid increasing our reliance on global antagonists like China. Um, and this is just a little bit of a rethinking. You know, the United States must not defer to extractive industries to solve perceived domestic supply issues. Further engagement with allies, investment in recycling and manufacturing systems, and protecting our nation's special places are all ways we can combat climate change. Um, because I didn't even mention that, you know, think about the carbon capture of a 4.4 million acre freshwater ecosystem. That's a whole other part of it as well. So again, it's about information and balancing it all, but it is all quite nuanced. And um, now, I think we're ready for questions. So I'm I'm going to come around with this so that everybody can get. And I'll, I'll start with you. Go here, here, and here. So you mentioned uh, recycling. Do you think that recycling can produce to solve the problem? <laughs> You know, I am not um, superbly well versed in uh, how much recycling can provide, but the reality is that copper is in so, I'm just going to use copper as an example. Copper is in so, so many things, um, so many products, cars, housing, you know, installation stuff. Uh, and we so drastically under recycle. You know, we our investments in recycling and reuse are so, so sad and, and pretty pitiful, actually. And so I do think um, I do think that it could really make up a, a significant amount of the minerals. And when we talk about copper being the most recyclable metal, I really think copper especially has a huge, huge um, supply boost that can be found in, in practices like recycling. Hello, I'm Sheila Martin. Um, this question may border on another social justice issue for our congregation, but how much of the nickel copper um, that's mined is for national defense? Um, that's a good question. I don't really know. I mean, I think because of the way that it needs to be smelted, um, a lot of it goes to China and is sold on the world market. So uh, it, I think it's pretty hard to sort of trace how, like, from a percentage of what comes out of the ground, what gets spent on national defense. Um, yeah, I can't answer that more specifically. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, quite a, quite a bit on circuit boards. A lot of circuit boards are used in military applications, and so circuit boards have a ton of copper on them, a lot of copper on them. Some of them are 12 layers. So, yeah. So I wanted to point out... Uh, 
we call China and antagonist. My name is Chuck Waite, by the way. I didn't should have talked about that. China is the owns and mines all the magnetite for magnets. So we buy all of our magnets from China. So they're not they're not an antagonist. They're they're doing business and not in, increasing the price. So um, I'm not sure why they say China is an antagonist. Well, and that's just the thing. The fear mongering is is kind of multi layered. You know, there's so much that we do um, with China. So many ways that uh, China can be an ally. And the reality of the situation of us actually sending these minerals to China, it's just a. a again, I think I think. Um, I've been trying to stay a little bit out of the politics of it, but it really is a political tool. It's a tool to um, communicate, you know, yeah, to make us afraid, to make us feel weak and to say, okay, here comes looming China and not talk about the productive ways that our relationship with China has built so many of our systems and so much of our technology. Instead, calling them, uh, very unfairly calling them antagonists. I mean, so it's very much a political tool that is not fairly representative of the relationship. Um, so hopefully this isn't leading us into too small a little rabbit hole, but when I think of the green economy, I think of the um, contribution that transportation makes to our um, climate change. And so, as you mentioned, Tesla, we think of um, electric cars, and electric cars need batteries. Um, now, I had read an article, and I'm just, I'm one of these that reads teeny tiny bits, and so I don't really know <laughs> everything, um, but uh, some of the new um, pickup trucks and SUVs that are electric, you know, great, better than gas, but they take batteries that are more than twice the size of earlier, smaller electric vehicles. And so I think when we think of consumption, it's not an all or nothing, but there's a, there's a dial to turn um, that we, we need to learn about and think about when we make our decision. Definitely, yeah. And I think, I think part of that, I mean, I think that's a perfect right example in terms of, you know, okay, electric car is better than gas car, but I'm used to driving my truck. And I need, uh, whether or not I need the truck for, you know, hauling purposes, this, that, or the other thing, which means it needs to be powerful, which means it needs a bigger battery which needs, means I need a bigger charger. Am I still, you know, we really traveled from point A to point B. Do we remember kind of the point of point A? And is it still better? I don't know, you know. So it's a good. I've got uh, two questions, if you can field both of them. Uh, the first one is, um, I'm curious about uh, advocacy on the uh, state level. So, um, I know there's been tons of litigation about environmental review with the MPCA, and permitting. Um, uh, can you speak to where we are currently uh, with respect to the Twin Metals Project? And then secondly, I'm curious about uh, your organization and Friends of the Boundary Waters, which is a different organization, and how you relate to each other and how cooperate and, yeah, and all that. Absolutely. Yeah, so we do a lot of work on the state level. Um, kind of like I said in the beginning, we really are pursuing a number of different strategic avenues. Um, and where we are on the state is actually really, really exciting. Um, we have a bill. Uh, we have a bill at the state legislature. So Senator Kelly Morrison is the Senate uh, introducer, and then Representative Sandra Feist um, introduced it. And it's an equivalent to a congressional bill. So it's the Boundary Waters Permanent Protection Bill, but instead of federal lands, it would protect all the state lands in the watershed because it's really a patchwork of private, state, and federal lands where if, it, if we just got the federal done, we'd still have the state to worry about and vice versa. Um, so this is a very common sense bill that would just do the same thing but on the state side. And it's very common that in these sort of national wilderness protections, the state will act and then the feds will act or vice versa. So they work in tandem together. Um, so we're very excited about that bill. We're going to have an educational hearing this session and then we're really kind of uh, gunning for the next session in terms of passage. Um, but we've been at the Capitol a bunch uh, in the past few months. We had a rally not too long ago that was really great and well attended. 
Um, so we're doing that. And then you mentioned our lawsuit. Yes, we have a lawsuit on the state level. Um, we are the only organization that is sued under this one uh, sort of subsection of MIRA, which is the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act, mm -hmm. which allows people to bring forward concerns about Minnesota's environmental practices. Uh, and in our case, we said Minnesota's non-ferrous mining rules, they allow for degradation of the boundary waters. The rules are not strong enough. The siting rules are not strong enough for, to protect the boundary waters. It allows for the siting of mines like the Twin Metals Mine immediately upstream. So we sued um, and the judge made a determination that we made our case. We presented all this information, why the rule was inadequate, why we needed to do more to protect the zero degradation standard, meaning the rule for wilderness is that nothing, you don't pollute it, you can't pollute it, zero degradation. Yeah. Um, he found that we proved our case, uh, and now we're actually anticipating a decision from the Minnesota DNR, it's supposed to come in before May 31st, which basically says, we found that yes, you made the full enough argument, um, the comments, they take in all these public comments, and we do need to change our rules, or they will find, no, we don't need to change our environmental rules, they're just fine the way they are. Twin Metals has intervened. Um, they are now part of this lawsuit as well. And so no matter what happens, somebody's gonna be unhappy. So if they wanna change the rules, Twin Metals will challenge. If they don't wanna change the rules, we'll challenge. And then we go into essentially a, um, it's called a contested case hearing, but it's a trial. Uh, an evidentiary trial, um, so that our summer is going to be uh, busy with with all that sort of thing. So, lots going on in the state. That was a long answer. As for Friends of the Boundary Waters, Friends of the Boundary Waters is a very well respected, uh, long standing organization that has done excellent work to protect the boundary waters uh, through policy, but also through things like they do a lot of trail maintenance and they work with the Forest Service and they take youth groups out to the boundary waters. Um, where we sort of uh, have our, our spaces, they are much more versed in the sort of the polymet fight. Uh, when that sort of came forward, it was around the same time, if not a little bit earlier than when Twin Metals really, it was apparent that Twin Metals was a problem. Um, and, you know, I like to sort of equate it to, you wouldn't expect a brain surgeon to be able to give you orthopedic surgery. Um, you know, uh, th the projects, while they're the same type of mine, are so different in terms of what they need um, from a policy standpoint, from a litigation standpoint, from an elected official engagement standpoint. Um, and so it actually really behooves, I think, the whole environmental community to have two strong players kind of working on different things. So we really just focus on the Boundary Waters Watershed, the Twin Metals Mine and other proposed mines. Um, and then Friends has a bit of a broader uh, sort of work lay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's short. I just wanted to know, there's Amy Klobuchar is in favor of mining. Why? Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so Senator Klobuchar um, is a challenge. Um, Senator Klobuchar's family is from the Iron Range area. Um, she really uh, feel strongly about her connection to that sort of old school iron mining family generational thing. I think that until, I think it's really hard to be a statewide politician in Minnesota, but I think what the reality is that there's been a faction of uh, sort of a pro mining Northeast Minnesota delegation that a lot of statewide politicians have been afraid of and they're dwindling. They're dwindling in power and they're dwindling in numbers as we all sort of come together to realize that there's a better vision for the communities of Northeastern Minnesota. So, so we, we, I need to wrap it up. So everybody, so a, a, after, after the talk, why don't you uh, mention? So I just want to, um, sorry to cut everybody off. Oh, that's we okay. We have to meet our time. Thank yep. you all for coming. Thank you, Ingrid, for presenting um, this information. This information is critical and I think gives all of us some uh, thoughtful um, ammunition to answer some of the questions that maybe we're all fielding around the new green economy. So I very much appreciate you putting that together for us today. I'm happy to provide resources. Uh, 
Uh, my email is very simple, and so I can. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm happy to correspond with folks individually, talk after, provide resources. There's a lot of sources for this information. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, next Sunday, we're going to welcome Gretchen Musicant, sitting in our audience today, a member, and Rachel Peterson to speak on Centering Children and Youth and Decision Making, the Minneapolis Child Friendly City Initiative. Both Gretchen and Rachel were members of a Minneapolis delegation in 2019 to a UNICEF USA meeting where the initiative was launched in the United States. So please come back for that, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much.